Now, let us move on to the second and major agenda item for this session, that is sensitivity-based approach. I assume that all of you are aware of this basic terminology, without which it will be truly confusing. I will try to just skim through this terminology for the benefit of those who are not clear. Risk position, the value of the instrument which is exposed to risk of loss due to variations in the market variables or risk factors. Then what is risk factors? These are the market variables which drives the change in the value of instruments like interest rate, equity prices, exchange rates, etc. What is a risk class? It is a grouping concept like Basel asset classes and credit risk. These classes are proposed mainly based on the risk drivers or risk factors. Risk bucket is visualized as a subgroup within each risk class. Sensitivity is the change in value of the instrument for a unit change in the risk driver. Now coming on to delta risk, vega risk and curvature risk. Delta risk measures the change in price due to a small price or rate shock to the value of each relevant risk factor. Vega risk is a risk due to variations in the volatility for options computed as the product of the vega of a given option and its implied volatility. And curvature risk captures the additional risk due to movement in the delta when the price changes. Both vega and curvature are applicable only for those instruments where in optionality is embedded. Let me now show you the exact information proposed by FRTB, which makes you understand better than understanding the abstract definitions. Now, let us look at this table. The leftmost column is having seven different risk classes like GIRR, equity, forex, commodity, and CSR, which is the credit spread risk. The next column has risk buckets. For example, in the case of GIRR, each currency is treated as one of the risk buckets. If you look at the equity, risk buckets are based on market capitalization, economy, emerging or advanced, and the sector. The next column is risk measures like delta, vega, and curvature, which I've just explained. Now, if we look at the last column, it has the regulatory risk factors. In GIRR, the risk factors have been defined based on two factors, a risk-free yielded curve for each currency and tenors. Hope this gives you some idea about risk classes, risk buckets, risk measures, and risk factor. Now, coming to comparison with credit risk, we all are familiar with credit risk, which is straightforward, but if you look at market risk, specifically FRTB, there will be multiple competitions, though it is standardized approach. Why is it so? I thought of explaining this by comparing credit risk capital computation. Hope this helps you understand intuitively. In credit risk, we map the exposures to different Basel asset classes based on the party type and product type. So party and product characteristics are the main risk drivers for credit risk. After proper bucketing of the exposures into different risk classes, we shall assign the risk weight based on the external rating. Issues and issuer ratings are considered. Finally, compute the RWA by multiplying with EAD with risk weight. I took the plain vanilla case of no mitigation for simplicity. Please note that in credit risk, an exposure can be mapped to one and only one asset class and even we should have one and only one risk weight in the plain vanilla case. Now, let us look at market risk. One instrument or risk position can be mapped to more than one risk class. Let me give you an example. A non-securitized corporate bond denominated in a currency other than the reporting currency of the bank. The value of this instrument will be impacted by different risk factors like interest rate, exchange rate, and credit spread. So it has risk exposure mapped to three different asset classes like GIRR, CSR, and exchange rate. This is one of the biggest reasons for computation complexity. Now, let us further understand. Within each risk class, different risk buckets have been created to facilitate computation of similar risk factors and handle diversification benefits consistently. This adds further complexity because the concept of risk bucket is not there in credit risk. The most important thing is capital computation, which is based on the risk sensitivity at each risk factor of the instrument and not the exposure value. And don't forget that one instrument can have multiple risk factors, we just saw in the example, right? On top of all these things, the risk factors have different types of impact on the value of instrument like linear impact, delta and vega, and non-linear impact curvature. 
compute the net sensitivities of each risk factor across the instruments and then apply the regulatory risk weights followed by sequential aggregations at bucket level, risk class level, duly factoring the correlations for diversification benefits. Hence, we end up in doing multiple computations to precisely estimate the total impact of different risk types on a particular instrument. Don't forget in market risk, we are first computing the capital charge and then RWA. Whereas in credit risk, we are first computing the RWA, then the capital charge in STD approach. Hope this gives you some idea on multiple steps involved in the computation of market risk capital charge. Now, let us discuss on the FRTB standardized approach. Instruments are first mapped to a set of regulatory prescribed risk classes and risk buckets based on the regulatory prescribed risk factors critical to each instrument. The bank would use sensitivities derived from its pricing models to determine the size of its risk positions with respect to each risk factor and compute the delta, vega, and curvature risk charges. For those instruments which have credit risk, a separate default risk charge is computed. If the instrument belongs to an exotic category, an additional risk add-on is required for computation. The sum of all these three capital charges is treated as capital charge under standardized approach. These are the high level steps we need to perform for each asset class. Now let us drill down to each component of standardized approach starting with delta and vega. The delta and vega risk charge computation methodology is very similar in nature as they are linear risk charges. Delta is required for all, whereas vega is required only for option embedded instruments. The computational procedure for linear risks can be divided into five calculation steps. Step one, assignment of positions to risk classes, buckets, and risk factors. In this picture, I've shown seven risk classes. For risk class one, there are three risk buckets like B, C, and D at instrument level. Step two, calculation of the risk factor sensitivities at instrument level. In this example, I've shown that risk bucket B is having three risk factors like K, L, and M. So the requirement is to calculate the sensitivity for each risk factor and compute the net sensitivity of a risk factor and across the instruments. Step three, calculation of weighted sensitivities at a risk factor level using the regulatory risk weights across the instruments. Step four, aggregation of weighted sensitivities per bucket duly factoring the diversification benefits through correlation. Step five, aggregation of capital charge on risk class level and no diversification benefit is made available. So it is a simple sum. If you look back, we started with instrument level, then risk factor level, then bucket, then risk class, finally at trading desk level. If you understand the illustration of one component like GIRR Delta, the rest will be more or less similar with some changes. Let us now see the curvature risk. The computational approach for non-linear risks can be divided into three calculation steps. The curvature risk measure represents the incremental risk not captured by the delta risk of price changes in the value of an option. Step zero, mapping of the instruments to risk classes or buckets, which we have already done. Step one, finding a net curvature risk charge, the CVRK, across instruments for a risk factor. This also starts with instrument level and then net at the risk factor level. Step two, aggregation of curvature risk exposure within each bucket using the corresponding prescribed correlation. Step three, aggregation of curvature risk positions across buckets within each risk class. You will need to apply the basic concepts of aggregation we have discussed in the earlier illustrations. Now, we have seen the computation of delta, vega, and curvature risk charges at different levels, starting at instrument level and then sequentially aggregating to risk class level, duly factoring the correlation for diversification benefit at each level. Now, one more complexity. We know that correlations increase or decrease in periods of financial stress. Hence, we need to compute risk charges under three different correlation scenarios low correlation, medium, and maximum. This is done by using multipliers for correlation parameters between risk factors within a bucket, 
and correlation across bucket within a risk class. If you look at the picture for trade desk one, risk class one, we are required to compute delta, vega and curvature under three different scenarios. At each scenario, we need to aggregate these numbers to get the sensitivity based capital charge that is SPC low, SPC medium and SPC high. And max of these things is considered the SPC for that risk class. Similarly, we need to compute the SPC for all the risk class. You can see on the right hand side SPC 1 to 7. Simple aggregation of SPC 1 to 7 will give the sensitivity based capital charge for all the risk classes, which is nothing but a trade desk SPC. If we want at bank level, we just need to aggregate the SPC of all trading desk. Just be aware we compute only the SPC. However, we have two more components left out in standardized approach. They are default risk charge and residual risk add-on. Trust me, they are not as complex as SPC capital. Now, let us review them also. What is DRC? Default risk is the risk of loss on account of default of issuer or obligor. But did we not capture the default risk within sensitivity based capital under credit spread risk class? In fact, we captured only the migration and not the jump to the default. Hence, this is required in addition to sensitivity based capital charge. So what is GTD? Jump to default is the risk of a sudden default. JTD exposure refers to the loss that could be incurred from a JTD event. How do we compute the default risk in credit risk? We all know that in credit risk, we compute the expected loss as a product of PD times LGD times EAD. In this case, our PD is 100%. So it is just a product of LGD and exposure at default, which is nothing but your notional principal plus PNL. So the formula is very straightforward. Do not forget to compute the default risk at the risk class level, starting with instrument level and sequentially aggregating at different level like obligar, then bucket and then risk class level. At the obligar level, offsetting is permitted. Offsetting refers to the netting of exposures to the same obligar, where a short exposure may be subtracted in full form of a long exposure. At the bucket level across obligars, partial hedging is permitted, where the risk of long and short exposures in distinct obligars do not fully offset due to the basis or correlation risks. Hence, hedging ratio is computed. With this understanding, now look at the steps. Now, if you can see the steps, the gross JTD risk of each exposure is computed separately. This is at the instrument level. The net JTD risk positions are calculated by using offsetting rules. This is at the obligor level. Within a bucket, hedging benefit and arrive at net JTD per bucket. This is at the bucket level. Risk weight the net positions and then aggregated. Regulators have prescribed different risk weights to different buckets. Bucket level DRCs are aggregated as a simple sum. This is at a risk class level. I don't want to spend much time on this, so let us quickly see what it is and where and how it is applied. The residual add-on is to be calculated for all instruments bearing residual risk separately in addition to other components of the capital requirement under the standardized approach. Residual risk add-on RRAO, is the risk weights applied to notional amounts of instruments with non-linear payoffs. So which instruments are subjected to RRAO? Instruments with an exotic underline like longevity risk, weather, natural disasters, etc. And instruments bearing other residual risks such as gap risk, behavioral risk, correlation risks, etc. The RRAO is the simple sum of cross notional amounts of the instruments bearing residual risks multiplied by a risk weight. 1% and 